Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Banker Next Door podcast. I am your host, Dr. Joe Burquist. Today, we're going to be talking about a little special episode today. We're going to be hitting on credit unions and their bank buying spree as of late. Uh, last week, they basically had five deals in one week. And I'm going to get into the trend here with credit unions buying banks. And then I'm, I'm going to talk about why this is not such a good thing uh, for the banking industry. Uh, I'm going to share some different uh, comments here from the ICBA, which is the Independent Community Bankers Association. But I just want to get into for a couple seconds here about what happened last week. So last week, uh, you had the number of bank purchases by credit unions is moving closer to last year's record total after a wave of announcements. Uh, basically, Five Star Credit Union kicked off the spurt of five such deals in one week with its announced acquisition of One South Bank on August 28th and Michigan State University Federal Credit Union quickly followed by announcing its purchase of McHenry Savings Bank on the same day. Both Five Star Credit Union and Michigan State University FCU again struck bank deals on the same day when they announced their purchases of Wilcox County State Bank and, if I'm, uh, if I'm saying this right, Algonquin, Algonquin State Bank on August 31st, respectively. Between those days of double deals, Innovations Financial Credit Union announced its purchase of First National Bank, Northwest Florida on August 29th. So this year started off slow with basically just a couple of these type of deals, but then the pace really picked up. So we've had 10 bank acquisitions by credit unions have been announced so far in 2023, uh, just, just four shy of the record of 14 such deals last year, uh, excluding terminated transactions, half of this year's deal were announced in the four days between August 28th and August 31st. Given the overall slow pace of the U.S. bank M&A market, only 72 U.S. bank deals have been announced through August 31st, and credit union accounts uh, credit unions account for buyers in nearly 14% of those deals. Um, and basically, the deal advisors said that they do expect this trend to continue. Uh, and one of their comments was, there are forces at the smaller level of banking that are driving sale and strategies in credit union land that are driving buyers. So I want to point out here, there's a, there was a great chart here, credit union, bank M&A deals. And what this points out is, so basically we're going from years here, 2015 through 2023, we have the total targeted assets here. And then we also have the number of M&A announcements actual. So here we can see that we, we hit a previous peak in 2019 of 13 deals where credit unions purchased banks for a total of 3.92 billion in assets. That dipped down in 2020, obviously due to the pandemic. And then we saw a, a bump up to 10 deals in 2021 and then 14 deals in 2022, which was an all time high. And now so far this year, we've got basically 10 deals here. Um, going down here to a little bit to the to the bottom, again, a uh, really nice chart here. But U.S. Bank M&A targets with credit union buyers by state since 2015. So there's a couple of states that have really been playing big in this in this trend. So Illinois has had 12 of these deals. And then as you go down south, Alabama's had seven, Georgia's had nine, and then Florida's had 15. So that's so between Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, I mean, that's where the bulk of this activity of credit unions buying banks has been has been taking place. Now, why and again, if you if you're not working in the banking industry, or if you're just a if you're just a consumer out there, you might be asking yourself, well, why why is this such a big deal? What does it really matter if credit unions are buying banks? Well, it matters very much because of the, the tax status of these two types of, of banking institutions. And, and you have to go back to the purposes of why they were originally set up to do different things. So credit union, if you go back to the earliest days of credit unions, you know, credit unions were set up and established to, to service a very specific customer. So say it was a, you know, the, the auto union in Michigan, you know, and they, and they had a uh, credit union that was set up, at, but the credit union was just a, you know, small one branch little bank that was maybe open Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from nine to one. And you had to be a member of the local auto union. You had to have, you know, your union card and everything come in and, and to, to be able to bank at that 
uh, little you know boutique credit union. That's not really what credit unions have become today. I mean, now now you've got credit unions that are you know multi billion dollars in size. They have full blown branches just that you know rival any other bank out there. Uh, they have full blown uh, branch networks marketing, branding strategies, you know, some of them are open six, seven days a week, have normal hours that, you know, and basically they're just competing with every other bank that's out there. Yet they still maintain the tax status and special treatment that they received when they were first set up. Set up. So, and I just want to read here uh, if I can, well, I'm going to, I'm going to get to, so I, what I've just brought up here for the podcast audience is uh, credit union acquisitions, of community banks are squeezing consumers. And I'm, I'm going to read for the, and we get into this in a second. But first, I just wanted to read. So this was a statement that was put out on September 1st by the Independent Community Bankers of America, the ICBA. And this was this was put out there by their president and CEO, Rebecca Romero Rainey. And she basically said, with a tax exemption worth nearly $4 billion per year, in stark contrast to the 12 billion in tax revenue community banks contributed in 2020, there was little wonder why credit union bank acquisitions peaked last year and are now on pace to match that record in 2023. Credit union executives can combine their members' capital with the savings from their tax exemption to make inflated all cash offers to buy out healthy community banks and largely private non-transparent deals. So you can see there that the tax exempt status is worth $4 billion per year. That's a, that's a very healthy, you know, big chunk of change there for credit unions that they can then use to go around and, and basically use that money to buy up other community banks. Now let's go to this infographic here that I have up and let's just run through a couple of these things here. So uh, credit union, federal income tax, tax dollars paid each year, zero. Uh, community bank tank tax contributions in 2020, 12 billion. Uh, the annual cost to taxpayers of the tax exemption on 1.8 trillion in credit union assets, 2 billion. 2020 tax liability of nurses, te nurses, teachers, and cashiers, respectively, 50, 56.6 billion, 19.8 billion, and 11.8 billion. So that means all these, you know, nurses, teachers, and cashiers, they're all paying a lot more money than what uh, credit unions are paying on their assets. Percentage of paycheck protection program, small business lending made by credit unions was 2%. Community bank share of paycheck protection program lending, uh, saving an estimated 49 million jobs was 60%. Years it took the credit union industry to double in size to 2 trillion with the largest tax unions, tax, or I'm sorry, the large, the largest credit unions comprising 75% of its tax exemption was six. Percentage of U.S. adults who said it is important that their financial institution does not receive taxpayer subsidies, 61%. Credit unions subject to the Community Reinvestment Act, which assesses service to low and moderate income communities, zero. Factor by which community banks, which are subject to CRA requirements, outnumber credit unions in low-income or distressed communities, two to one. Percentage of federally insured credit unions that have low-income status, though only 13% are in low and moderate-income areas, 53%. Percentage of U.S. counties with significant levels of poverty that have at least one community bank or community bank branch, 97%. Year Congress charted credit unions as not-for-profit institutions, a law that has never been updated despite their expansion beyond their statutory mission, what I was just, what I was just talking about, 1934. Year Congress set a precedent by revoking the tax exemption for building and loans, cooperatives, and mutuals of you know, different types of banks because they operate too much like commercial banks, 1951. So in other words, you, you have... Uh, you have a, a number of different banks out there in the market, what they just said. I mean, you had, you know, buildings and loans, which, yeah, not too many of those anymore. A couple cooperatives, mutuals. You know, you can also have thrift and savings banks out there with commercial banks. But they, in 1951, Congress decided that, hey, we got to get rid of this, uh, exempt, this tax exemption. We need to level the playing field for everybody out there. But, you know, they've never done that with credit unions. You know, this, since credit unions were created in 1934, that has never been adjusted. And, and like I said, this has really been kept, um, this has really been a contentious issue in, in the banking industry for, uh, for quite a while now. And I, you know, I got to believe that sooner or later, this is good. This is going to 
come to a head in some way, shape or form in terms of, of what's going to happen here. Because like I said, you, you know, you have these credit unions now, a lot of them, you know, cause you know, some of them are still out there. They still operate like they were originally intended and set up in 1934. But, but what you're finding when you look across the country now is that you have a lot of these credit unions have now grown up to one, two, three, four, five, seven billion dollars in asset size and, you know, have 50, a hundred branches and, and operate in a very real way, just like any other, you know, commercial bank or, or uh, community bank that's out there. And, but they have this massive tax exempt status and they're using this money to, to buy up other community banks, which really has those community banks at a, at a, at a disadvantage. Now, on the, on the one hand, I will also note that, that I can't, you know, I think it's hard to necessarily blame the banks who have, have sold because, you know, they, they've got a duty and an obligation to their shareholders. They have to try to, if, if they're going to sell, they have to try to maximize the value of the bank to get the highest return to the shareholders they possibly can. They have that fiduciary duty. The board of the bank has that fiduciary duty that they have to do that. So, you know, it, it's kind of hard if you, you know, if you got a credit union that, that's coming in there and basically saying, hey, you know, they're they're putting this all cash offer on the table or, or putting a dynamite offer on the table. How do you know from the you know, how do you turn that down if you're trying to get the best deal that you can for your shareholders? So, uh, you know, so like I said, th this is this is an issue that is is again, I, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. But I do think that that credit unions are going to start to get get probably a good amount of pushback on this. I think that, uh, you know, banking organizations like the ABA, the ICBA, uh, are going to continue to to push back on this and and ask that Congress do something to rectify the issue. In other words, if that tax exemption was was reduced or if it was taken away altogether and the the the, the you know playing field was you know everything was back to a level playing field, you know then it would then it would probably that the 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 thing would probably rectify itself. But we'll have ultimately uh, we'll have to see what happens there. And kind of go from there, but you know, I've I've definitely been on the side of community banks here with this, and uh, I hope it's something that Congress finds a way to to rectify in some way, shape, or form uh, to kind of balance the equation here a little bit because it's you know ultimately I you know I don't think it's a great thing that you know community banks are just are, are getting you know bought up by credit unions right now, uh, and and I and I hope that, again I hope that trend doesn't continue into the future, but. Uh, if you like what you heard here, please remember to uh, like and subscribe. Uh, you can follow me on YouTube, Rundle, Rumble, and all major podcast platforms. Uh, if there's a topic that you like that you'd like me to cover, make sure to please leave a comment. Uh, you can also go to the to my website, uh, thebankernextdoor.com, and there's a contact form there. You can leave you know you can leave a comment on there. Uh, which I'd be happy to respond to, or uh, like I said, address any topic that you might be interested in hearing. And I hope, you know, but I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this episode and uh, hope to be back and see everybody again real soon. Thanks a lot.